that. And this should start buffering. Okay. And at this point, we should be streaming live. But of course, I can never tell 100% until I'm getting feedback from, um, from the chat or from YouTube itself. So I never really know for sure if I'm streaming live until live is actually happening. <laughs> I'm already managed to tangle my strings here. But should be doing pretty good. It is Monday. It is noon. It is time for a live stream. So hello everyone, I assume someone is here. Hi, hopefully. My name is Odin and uh, welcome to my live stream. I've, I've got a YouTube channel called Odin Makes, just in case you didn't bother to read the anything going on around the window when you clicked here. Every Monday I've been working with my friend Felicia and we've been working on putting together um, the Witcher build. We've been, we've been, you know, here I am trying to put the bottom part of the corset on, on the body form. And this has been a strictly live stream build. Every Monday for two hours we work on this, and that's the only two hours of the week it gets any attention. Well, it just so happens that today, Felicia's out of town. So I get the fly, I get the fly solo. Almost. I've got, I've got some help here in the studio. One of my, one of my uh, patrons and, and, and soon-to-be good friend, Darren Calvin, he, he volunteered to come in and help me with some uh, technical directing on the side. So he's not going to be on camera. He's off to the side helping with maybe switching cameras, definitely watching the chat, watching comments, and, and feeding me things to, to be able to talk about so I don't have to try and split my attention in eight different ways and miss everything. But, uh, hello, how's it going? So it's just me, there's no Toby, there's no Bruno, there's no Felicia. Aww. They'll all be back next week. And for now, I'm still working on the Witcher build. The plan for today is to work on the straps. So I'm going to get the top put back on it. And there's like that three-way kind of Y strap that goes over the chest. I want to start putting that together. Because that should be, shouldn't be too terribly hard to do. <laughs> but that's the plan. So, hello, how's it going? And uh, does anybody have anything to say? Is it, are there people here? Tons of people saying hello. Sweet. Hello. Jack of all trades, Duncan McGee. Jack of all trades, right. Junk of, Jack of all trades is here. Hello, hello. William Connors. Excellent. Hello, William Connors. Give me just a second to lace this up. And I know I've got something that I was supposed to do. I need to check my notes again, make sure I say the right thing. Some sort of like puppet master thing I was supposed to do for Jack of all trades. I say that, but you know, it's, we're just having fun. Give me here. You know, this doesn't need to be perfect. Mm. We got proper crests rolling in already. Got proper crests rolling in already. Of course we do. <laughs> to, that's, you know, that's um, being a prop <laughs> builder and, and asking for requests. That is pretty standard to get uh, a lot of prop requests. So this last Friday, um, I did another, uh, what is it? <laughs> well, it's an interview. Um, the, the channel that I've worked with, the show that i worked with called Beyond Geek, doing uh, another interview with them. It's a video interview. I do not know when it's going to be posted to YouTube. Uh, I know it was uh, kind of an experiment from Joe. It was going to be uh, the first one because he wants to do more than just the one. But uh, we did that. So that's coming up, and that'll be on the Beyond Geek YouTube channel, uh, which is a show that ran on PBS, still runs on PBS, I think, that I helped out with. I, was, uh, I built some props. I built the superhero suit for episode six fully. In fact, we cast Sage's head on screen during the episode. And uh, I did a lot of the editing and did some of the shooting, and <laughs> it just, you know, it was a... It was a small crew. It was a, uh, a personally funded project. It was totally funded by Joe. It didn't have any sponsors. So everybody wore all the hats they could in order to make this thing happen. But there's been 14 episodes. It's had two seasons. Joe's working on a third season. It would have been done if this whole like pandemic thing didn't happen. But, um, you know, it's fun. I actually really enjoy the show. It's on Amazon. So if you don't find it on your local PBS station, uh, you should be able to see it through Amazon Prime. So... There is, it's, it's there. Otherwise, there's, um, I'm walking through the clamshell. Here. You can easily see a lot of the, the trailers, a lot of the, the previews on YouTube. So why aren't the episodes on YouTube? 
Well, they're not on YouTube because Joe's had deals with uh, Discovery Channel in Poland. It ran on Discovery Channel in Poland. It's, it's run on uh, televisions on airlines. It's ran in a few other international markets. And in order to keep the value for the show to run on cable uh, networks in different countries, it kind of has to not be on the internet where it's available for free. So unfortunately, the episodes aren't on YouTube. They're only on Amazon Prime, but you know, you can see them there. Dan does junk would like to know, what is your honest opinion on snowboarding? <laughs> Dan does junk. Didn't we talk about this last week? <laughs> well, all right. Let's see here. What is my honest opinion on snowboarding? To recap, to recap really quickly from last week, uh, Felicia and I and and uh, Nicole King from Patreon and, and a number of other people all talked about uh, snowboarding and and some of the first times we tried it. And I have gone once. I went once in the early nineties. The the whole. Department I was working with at uh, the video production center I was at all wanted to go do this. They all talked about how much fun it was. I went, rented the gear. We went, got off the ski lift, fell on my face. Somehow managed to stand back up with both my feet attached to the board. Found out that I don't really have balance when I don't have independent foot movement. And uh, continued to uh, try to do the whole snowboard thing and fell on my face. And uh, slowly started falling my way down the mountainside. Um... <laughs> The longest single run I did was maybe a couple hundred yards backwards, you know, just totally uh, accidentally before I caught the edge and fell on my face. So, Dan does junk. What is my true, honest opinion of snowboarding? Well, much, much like I said last week, kind of want to keep this a family show, but honestly, the only real, real way I can say this is, fuck that. <laughs> Skiing, I like skiing. Of course, I haven't done skiing since the 80s when I was in high school and considerably lighter. But skiing, I could do because I had independent feet, foot movement. So um, <clears throat> uh, another takeaway from this is I will not be cosplaying as a green army man from Toy Story. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, I suppose my balance is uh, also based a little too much on, too much on friction with the floor. <laughs> so, Dan... Thanks for the question. Thanks for the uh, the prompting me to, to swear my live stream. Oh no, we're gonna be demonetized. Oh wait, uh, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, let's see. I should actually give me a second to get this tied, and I will double check what it was Nicole wanted me to say. I think to Frank. I think I'm supposed to be saying something to <clears throat> Frank with with a. Uh, Excellent little gift that went along went along with it. Of what did you do? <laughs> Jack of all trades says, "Hey, I'm a snowboarder. How dare you insult my hobby?" Not at all. <laughs> this the the opinion of snowboarding is solely my opinion, based completely on my abilities, and I know that it is something that a great number of people enjoy. Plus, I know there are lots of different ways that you can enjoy snowboarding, but this is not how Odin makes. <laughs> <laughs> Smith says Odin hating snowboarding needs to become a tradition for every strain. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Open Makes a Live Stream, and today we're going to talk briefly about snowboarding. Fuck that! <laughs> now we're going to move on to the next subject. <laughs> Here's my co-host for today, Kevin. <laughs> Named after the bird from Up, I think. Let's see. Huh. Connor Cook says, you can still be the Green Army Man for Toy Story. Yeah, you All just... you have to do is break the board in half and magnetize it back together. <laughs> or you just throw the thing down and just stand on it. I think yeah. um, there, was, there was a guy I saw at <laughs> the last Silicon Valley Comic Con, because they've changed the name now. Like Adam Savage just took over, and I think it's just called Silicon now, right? Um, but anyway, the last one I, I went to, the guy was great. Uh, he, he would set up and hold the pose for a very long time, knew all the poses of the Green Army Men. Uh, and I don't think... The board was actually attached to his feet. I think he just stood on it. 
Now the 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 actors at Disney, they're actually attached to the board and do the the waddle walk. It's yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Let's see, where did it go? Ah, here we are. So from Rodimus Prime or Nicole King is uh, hey Frank, your newest Patreon. I, I have no recollection for lines, right? Hey, Frank, your newest patron, Nicole, told me to give you a shout-out, so I hoped you liked it. Now, go build something. So, uh, Frankly Builds actually does a lot of really cool builds. I know Frank did a, uh, a full Iron Man Mark 85 suit, the 3D printed, fully done up. The, the most recent uh, stream he did, I think that's what's standing up behind him in the back. And it looks freaking great. So, Frank... Uh, I love what I'm seeing. Nicole, I'm enjoying doing the shout out. And if there's some way that maybe Frank, you and I can coordinate and do some sort of quasi live stream combo thing together, maybe we need to talk about that because that'd be pretty cool. So there. <laughs> Got that obligation out of the way. No, that's a really, it's a really mean thing to say. But what's fun is, um, <laughs> hey Darren, can you hit the, the close up button on two there? Uh, uh, the, the camera itself. The, uh, right, right. Sorry, it was a little power button in the corner. Try to set them up in the corner. Now I can't easily walk over there. So it's around the front. You just have to kind of reach around and just, you might have to click it twice. That's it. That's it. It's on the bottom. Yep. There. Oh, okay. First time the screen will come on. Second time it should get close. Yeah. Yeah? It's looking at your shirt. Good. How's this? Am I on the, is the, the GIF on frame? That way. Yeah, there you go. Alrighty. So, of course, uh, this came along. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, did you do? What did you do? So you got you hit, brought up camera two for them yeah. to see it. Cool, right on. So, yeah, Frank, you know I think it'd be cool. Uh, I need to watch more of your stuff because what I've seen is really impressive. So, hey, Frank, how's it going? <laughs> Getting a lot of buzzing activity. Back on one. Back on one. So you're getting oh, all oh, right. Boy, why is my why is my phone? View in bed. I'm done viewing in bed. Check my patrons. <laughs> Will Connor says, YouTube just suggested that Odin makes a grilled cheese sandwich. Rewatching that now. So the grilled cheese sandwich, if you haven't seen it, that was my very first uh, April Fool's video from like 2017. What's up? Oh, uh... Prime Guy 98 says there's a weird little bubble in the brown leather on the left side. Here? I assume? Probably. It's um probably just tension from I think it's just tension. Yeah. <coughs> there is there is a brown, weird little bubble, but I think it's just tension because I didn't bother to lace everything up. And uh, <coughs> the the vinyl is just contact cemented to the, the what the foam. So it's possible that parts of it will pop up. You know, it's <clears throat> what happens. <laughs> but uh, any little bubbles like that, you should be able to, to tighten up and, and, and make disappear. And if we have to, we can um, get a little bit of super glue behind it. Just go in either through the foam or through the vinyl and smash it all back down again. So I'm not too worried about it. Connor Cook would like to know, what is your favorite genre to make props from? Connor Cook, so what is my favorite genre to make props from? Sci-fi. Uh, now, that may not be specifically what you're trying to ask. So is it movies? Is it video games? Is it comic books? His examples included games, movies, etc. and oh, okay. or action horror, sci-fi. So. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> sure. So sci-fi and movies. Uh, I absolutely love movies. Um, one of the benefits of having an engineer for, for, a, for a father who would do the majority of his work mentally in order to stop working, he couldn't just leave the office. He would actually need to distract himself. And so it became a habit in the 80s that we'd just go to the movies and see anything. And he enjoyed he enjoyed sci-fi. I think he enjoyed sci-fi because he knew I enjoyed sci-fi. And he was happy to go see a movie that I enjoyed because he could... Being a father, I get it. You, you, you enjoy what your son's enjoying. Um, so constantly would go out and see movies. And I saw all sorts of... <laughs> the, the trash 80s films, you know, science fiction 80s films. And um, so, yeah, definitely I enjoy that. That's easily gravitate towards that because that's something that, that's got a lot of good memories for me. So I really do like the sci-fi stuff from, um, from movies. 
And I am fine admitting and making fun of the fact that the vast majority of my builds are silver metal. That's not really my intent. I'm not specifically picking out, all right, what am I gonna make this week that's silver? It's just kind of working out that way. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny in a way that, oh, hey, this one's red, it's different. Because <laughs> it just, they're all Mega Godzilla and, and, you know, I guess it's half and half with Soul Edge. Like the most colorful thing I've done probably is the Gundam, but everything else seems to be dirty metal. <laughs> Yeah. Willie Hardstat, sorry, excuse me, Willie Halstead would, would like to know what's the hardest project you've ever done? William Hardstat's asking, what is the hardest project that I've ever done? So am I going to be able to? No, nah, I'm not going to try to make that happen. Hang on, hang on right now. Um, hardest project, hmm. Because there's big projects, there's long projects, there's involved projects, right? Like I did a big, big project where I had to build a um, a kind of cheesier, simpler version of the original series Star Trek bridge, and I only had a week to do it while the rest of the crew was off doing a trade show, so I had the warehouse to myself. Um, and and so yeah, that was you know not going home and cutting a bunch of plywood for a week. Um, but as far as the stuff that's behind me. I think one of the things I usually say is the gravity gun, uh, which is out of frame. It's, it's <laughs> up on the wall. Um, just because it was really fairly involved with, with a um, non-standard grip arrangement and, and the, uh, the, the box of the body on the back was seven-sided. It wasn't normal. And then the barrel's nine-sided, which you know that divides into 360 pretty easily. You just put it up at 30 degree angles, but still you got to figure all that out. And then you got the three claws that are, you know, and anyway, so that was that was involved. Um, but difficult things I'm looking at is the 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 wow Lich King helmet. That was actually pretty difficult. Um, just because of the the amount of detail and the amount of pressure I put myself on that I didn't want to just slap it together and call it good. Uh, what was the other one that I recently did that no, it was Mechagodzilla's arms. You know, the, 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 there's like there's like weird little details. There's weird problems that pop up in different projects that become really difficult. But once I'm done with it, I'm happy and moving on to the next thing. And I don't really dwell on what was hard. I just get happy with when they're finished and I can I got something to move on and, and play with. So is that? Uh, let, let me turn around and look. <laughs> Anything else going to jump out at me going, oh yeah, that was a pain in the ass. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> not, not that I specifically remember, not that I specifically have uh, horrible memories over. So, <laughs> yep, I'll, I'll go with a gravity gun, make a Godzilla's arms, building a, a large, you know, it was 20 feet, 22 feet wide, the set that I built. So we had to, had to build it in the warehouse so it would fit the space that we had where we were actually going to shoot with it. And I had to build it um, uh, in pieces so it could be moved with a with a with a, a regular truck. So it had to break down into smaller components so we could put it into the bed of, a, of just a pickup truck and move it. And then I think I had a budget of a thousand dollars, and that included paying any assistance that I had to come in and work with me. So you know, it got to do all that. <laughs> Worked. It was fun. That was 20 years ago. <laughs> On the topic of Mechagodzilla... Yes. Uh, somebody oh. suggested, whose name I can't find... Oh, here it is. Data North. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, suggested that you could also make uh, the crewman helmet, so whenever con op cons open up, you and Joe could pal around. Yes. Um... <laughs> I thought about that. Now I'm doing the specifically the 1974 Mecha Godzilla, which means the crewmen are kind of Planet of the Eight knockoffs when they don't look like humans, um, but they wear silver suits. The Mecha Godzilla two, the crewmen they have have those awesome silver helmets uh, that 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 have the, the 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 fins with the with the balls on the end of it, and and they have a, a bigger silver ray gun. So I might be willing to do a mashup between the two of them, but. Um, no, I've talked about it. I've, I've got a couple of other friends, aside from Joe, who are huge kaiju fans. Yeah, uh, You might have heard of him, McThor. Um, anyway, he, he and his girlfriend were, were talking about uh, being 
um, handlers and, and wearing silver suits with me as I walk around, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to have an adventure? In, incognito? <laughs> That's <is> cool. <laughs> Let's see, let's get let's get clips and not put not put needles into these belts. Uh, that was a good question and I lost. Oh, uh, <laughs> happens. Jerry, Jerry Riggs Props wants to know: Is there a prop you made in DIY prop shop that you would like to redo, knowing what you know now? Good question. Uh, so. Jerry Rig Props, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat it. I don't know how well you can hear Darren. You can probably hear him just fine because the mic isn't that bad, but Jerry Rig Props was asking, is there a prop I did for a DIY prop shop that I would like to redo knowing what I know now? Yeah, actually, um, there's a couple. Um, I say that and I immediately forget what, 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 what the first one was. <laughs> but there was, uh, I know there was a couple. I wouldn't mind redoing um, see, I did. I, I did one. I did the uh, uh, the Pit Boy, right? I wouldn't mind redoing uh, the Evil Dead chainsaw, kind of, because I would like to do it more appropriately sized. It's it's fine. It looks great. I'm looking at the wrong camera. It's fine. It looks great. <laughs> it um, it totally works. But the body of it is a little too big. It was one of those things where I got a plastic. Uh, to start with, I used like a plastic container. I think M&M's came in because my hand fitted it great. And it was about the right size. But when you add plywood to the side so the, the blade will get supported, then you wrap it in foam, it got to be oversized. It's much larger than the, than the home light saw. Not that anyone cares, right? But it's one of those things in the back of my mind that I go, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of wrong. Kind of. <laughs> so I wouldn't mind. No, the one thing I really would like to do, and I have kind of thought about it, but it's fairly involved, and um, I'm not sure. Marceline's axe. That was actually ultimately a lot of fun. Um, what I did was one of the last uh, big episode, big builds I think I did for a DIY prop shop was uh, Marceline's guitar axe, or her battle axe from Adventure Time. Only I used a, a bass guitar kit I bought off of eBay and built a working guitar. Um, then I unfortunately painted it totally the wrong way because I had no idea what I was doing. And so that's kind of a big part of where I would like to do it again. I, I think it would be really cool to redo the, the bass guitar um, and uh, paint it appropriately. And there's actually somebody in the building here who's one of the patrons as well that has made custom guitars or at least has refinished a lot of, uh, a lot of guitars. And so that, that also becomes kind of a thought that, hey, there's even someone in the building that knows what they're doing. Right? I just made sure to, to just doctor the kit enough that I could make it look like the battle axe, but I didn't change any of the, of how the kit actually went together because I didn't know if the guitar would still play, you know, if I changed exactly where the, the strings attached and whatnot. And thankfully I didn't because when I took it to a guitar shop and said, hey, can you help me make sure this thing's gonna play? Uh, they let me know that, yeah, no, if you changed any of that, it wouldn't have sounded right. It'd been almost impossible to tune. It's like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> so I think that would be really kind of cool. Um, what was the other thing I was thinking about? Oh, yeah, no. That was that was something else. That wasn't even that wasn't even a prop related thing. That's just uh, making equipment to help Joe shoot stuff for Beyond Geek. So, Art, never mind. <laughs> Art Man Twenty Nineteen wants to know what the most difficult part of his pattern was to make. Um, difficult part of Art Man's pattern for for the Mandalorian helmet, yeah. which was just last week's video actually. Hey, let me let me clip this belt on. Okay, so what was the most difficult? But you know the the I drop stuff. Um, <laughs> the dome went together beautifully. Uh, had no problems with the dome at all, and I and I immediately I'm gonna knock this right off the table. Where stay, Kevin? Um, come here, come here, come here. Something like that. Great, that part fell out. That's important, so it sits right in my head. I actually bought a, a set of helmet pads to put inside, so it sits right. So the dome worked great. The dome went together exactly the way it's supposed to, and it has a really good, smooth shape. Uh, I'm actually very impressed with that. Uh, I redid mine two or three times, because if you look at some of the clone trooper helmets I did, the dome 
has the very slight catcher's mitt shape that the Lana Calrissian helmet has. What was the most difficult part? Figuring out the angles of the cheeks. Uh, I, I even kind of talked about that a little bit in the video. That getting the, uh, the angles to, to fit together right and to fit together in a way that didn't have big gaps, that took three and a half attempts three and three quarter attempts because there were times when I would cut something out and start grinding it to make make angles for it and then I would grind them again until it got to a point to where they weren't going to work in which case I would then cut out a new set and start over so I'm pretty sure this was the third version now what's not fair is I don't think I put the modified cheeks up uh, on the pattern for everyone to download but um yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> en enjoy the pain. <laughs> um, but no, that went together really well. The um, little little things that I did with it that I'm uh, sad about. I did a lot of uh, of of work on this with clearing up uh, or cleaning up the sides using spackle, right? To try and get the sides as smooth as I could. To try and get as good of a of a reflection on it as I could. But I didn't do that to the ears. So um, I'm not sure if you can see that, but the top of the ears still has a really rough um, foam texture. The, the, the sides just aren't as smooth as they could be because I didn't really seal the foam. So that, that's a regret. But uh, everything else I think worked out really well. I'm really very happy with um, how the vent in the back went together, which is something I changed from his instructions considerably. But um, I'm really happy the way that ended up looking. So... Yeah. Thank you, Artman 2019. This was great. <laughs> Prime Guy 98 would like to know what the smallest prop you may ever made is. Okay, so ever? <laughs> the he smallest ever. Ever. <laughs> okay, so the smallest prop replica that was actually a, a replica of something on screen. Um, I made for Smosh, and that was Corbin Dallas's Matchbox from uh, Fifth Element, where I found a Matchbox and, and made a graphic of the very similar double palm tree with the double moons on, on whatever beach this Matchbox is supposed to be. And we you know put a couple matches in it so Ian or Anthony could rattle it. Um, for the channel, we're looking at... And then we 3D printed the Noisy Cricket for... Um, what was the Elegoo Mars, I think, where that one was for. Um... What else have I done that's really small? For TikTok, I remember doing um, like the Adventure Key from the old Atari game Adventure. That was you know, only so big. It was kind of small because I had to do things really <laughs> quick for that, for those, for those videos. Um, I didn't really make the Dragon Balls. That was all Sherby. Now, if you want to go smaller than that outside of, of, of just model making or, 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 or painting Adeptus Titanicus miniatures from Warhammer 40K, which are five millimeter tall soldiers. Um, the smallest thing I think I made is back in the late 90s, I made a custom Death Star Trooper helmet that would fit on the Lego men, <laughs> uh, as well as a Death Star Gunner helmet. So, um, and this was the first time when I really figured out that using nail files of, as, as Embry boards for getting stuff really smooth and shiny was, worked really well. Um, but that was one where I made a shape that I liked, cast, you know, got it, got it shiny, and it was a real basic teardrop. Made a mold of that, cast it, and then using that casting and, and put some styrene on it to build <laughs> up the, the forehead plate and the extra back plates and stuff. Um, and those ended up working, and uh, I sold a few of them on the internet. Of course, the pieces are available now, but they weren't when all they were were the yellow-faced uh, Lego men with, with some of the, the basic Star Wars sets that first came out with <coughs> Episode One. You know, when, when weirdly enough, it was hard to get a Stormtrooper. What? Yeah, I have 18 Luke Skywalkers and one Stormtrooper in the game with a big, expensive set. Thanks, Lego. But... Um, no, they, they, they remedied that, so uh, that, that was, they came out with a really cool little set where it was, um, I think it was Luke still, and it came with an Imperial officer and a, uh, and a Stormtrooper, and it was just a little tiny diorama set of when Luke surrendered to the Imperials at the end of Jedi. Uh, spoiler! And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like a $5 set at the time, and I, I don't know, I probably bought 50 of those things just to get the Stormtroopers. And it came with an Imperial, so why not, you know? 
So that's probably the smallest. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned the snitch. Uh, the Golden Snitch from DIY Prop Shop. Sure. Um, honestly, I forgot about that. Uh, the Golden Snitch was a DIY Prop Shop build, and that was a ping pong ball with uh, um, earbud cords because uh, the Snitch has a bunch of raised uh, bars on the side, a bunch of raised detail on the outside. And so um, that was all super glued with, with, with cheap earbud cords. And then I found these kind of rubberized, I think they were um, um, fern leaves, uh, I don't think they were feathers specifically. They may have been feathers uh, from a craft store. And I scraped like most of the glitter off and snipped the, the feathers off one side in order to make the feathers for, uh, the, for the Golden Snitch. And since then, I've had people send me pictures of the Golden Snitches that they built uh, inspired by my video. And one guy went and actually cut individual veins uh, for, the, for the wings from a piece of uh, metal, so it looked just like the one, that, the way it's supposed to look in the movie, the one the movie was CG, but it looked just like the, what it's supposed to look like for the movie. It was just really, really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, but that's, that's up high in a glass bell jar, and I'm always afraid of breaking it every time I move it, so it's gonna stay up there right now. <laughs> Train! So where Train! Am I? Train! <laughs> Let's see, we're looking at belts. Uh, Mason Rowell wants to know where the name Odin makes come from. Jason wants to know where the name Odin makes comes from? Yes. Well, it came from the need of having to have a channel, uh, a name for the channel, right? It was going to be kind of, kind of important. Um, and I was trying to look at stuff that not only wasn't used on YouTube, but the URL was available. And um, I had a couple of different thoughts, but then Odin Makes just seemed like a good catch-all. Because at the time when I started it, I didn't know for sure if it was gonna be strictly foam cosplay or if I was gonna be making other stuff. Foam cosplays, I've always been really happy and comfortable with that, so that's just kind of what it became. But theoretically, it could be anything. Um, that's why I don't mind doing the 3D printing. Um, so Odin Makes was just a, a little flash of inspiration <laughs> as I rode around in the back of the car while we all went out to dinner one night. It's like, oh, I'll just call it that. And it was funny because uh, I think my wife's first reaction was, you want to call it that? All right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and her and then um, uh, Joe's opinion as well, Joe from Beyond Geek, they both laughed saying, well, you called it Odin Makes. You can't have any other one else as a guest on now because what are you going to do, rebrand the channel that Joe makes? <laughs> 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 we'll figure that out because uh, that actually has come up. Not that I'm going to need to have it happen, but what if I get sick? What if I end up having to go somewhere and uh, and I'm not going to be able to get a video finished in time? You know, uh, so at this point, both Joe and Felicia are good possibilities as a guest host. So there's a point in time in the future, maybe nothing is planned right now, where I would end up still doing the VO. Uh, but they would actually do the build on the show. So, uh, you yeah, know, that could happen. But that's that's where the name came from, was was just the need to have a name. It was available, and it was my name. So why not? <laughs> huh. Jacob Obert says, rebrand to OCU, Odin Cosplaying Universe. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the OCU. <laughs> Today we're going to make Odin's spear. Next week we're going to make Odin's eye patch. The week after that we're going to start making Odin's armor. And then we're going to start making uh, the perch for Odin's ravens. And um, and the plan here for May is to make the bowl of grapes that Loki was eating out of while he's disguised as Odin in the beginning of Thor Ragnarok. Odin's favorite Marvel movie. <laughs> Welcome to the OCU. <laughs> John Doe would like to know if you ever had plans on making an Iron Giant suit. Oh, wow. Iron Giant was an awesome movie. Um, right now, I don't have plans to make an Iron Giant suit. I think if you dig in my Instagram, maybe, or my Facebook page, maybe, from, what was that? Was that 
was that 2019 or is that 2018? That might have been 2018. I can't remember which year it was. I went up to a science fiction convention that happened in a college, Lower Columbia College. This was in uh, in Washington, and um, they built like a half scale cardboard iron giant that kind of sat in the corner of the con, and that thing was really cool. I think. Um, oh man, now I'm, now I'm blanking on the guy's name, and I just saw it because. <laughs> Oh, that's that's horrible. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Builder. <laughs> CJ, please let him know. I'm sorry. I forgot his name right now. But did a phenomenal job getting this thing put together and getting it put together in a hurry. And and that con was a lot of fun to go to. So that was the one and only Iron Giant thing that I've really kind of was part of. Um, it was David Jones, right? That was his name, David. Uh, so sorry if I'm saying your name right now. Big mountain of a man, big red head, freaking nice guy. <laughs> um... But, um, yeah, so that was the Iron Giant thing that I was part of. Jacob Obert says, Iron Giant's proportions are so out of whack, any cosplay would look off. Yep, pretty much. And they are. Iron Giant is walking around on little stick legs. So <laughs> yeah, if you sure. wanted it to look right, you would end up cosplaying like the way a lot of people cosplay General Grievous, where you're actually a black bodysuit with a rod puppet in front of you. And I think that's yeah. probably the only way you could really do Iron Giant without making him kind of look like an SD Gundam, those little super deformed Gundams. Maybe some kind of uh, build that involves stilts. Yep. Yeah, stilts could, could work. Um, man, that'd be weird. No, it could still work, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> From snowboarding, I know that my balance is kind of shite, so uh, I don't think I'd want to do a whole lot of um, heavy upper body cosplay and then wear stilts to boot. That <laughs> just sounds like a recipe of falling down, <laughs> which which right. that's a fun movie, too. <laughs> when did I become the bad guy? Says Michael Douglas falling down. That's a, I enjoyed that one. Not the happiest of movies, <laughs> not by a long shot, but I like the movie. So I'm just checking out. I've got multiple belts. What I want to, what I'm looking at doing is taking these these belts, most of which are leather, and making the three-way strap because it comes comes down to a ring, and then there's another one that comes off from here, and then there's one that goes around to the backside. And if that's all I can get done today, cool. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> but that does mean I get to use a leather punch. And a, uh, oh, there's no blade on this one, and a hammer! So we get to do that in a little while. Because, you know, having done audio for a number of, of, of shoots and other productions, the whole idea of, hey, it's a live stream and I have no control over the audio. Let's swing a hammer and pound on stuff. You know, it's just, yeah, people seem to say it's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of things, Odin, uh... Lieutenant Angry Dwarf. I should probably should have done that one yet. That's suggests right. making Gunir from Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Oh yes, I wouldn't mind making more Mjolnir's. Um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla would be good. The one that's in uh, a God of War would be really cool to build. Um, oh, there's another one I'm forgetting right now, but there's been a few of them, and I probably should. And oddly enough. I have a couple of them written down, but I just kind of keep forgetting about them. <laughs> Actually had a suggestion to one of my... I think it came directly. I think it was a direct message through Instagram. So if it was one of you watching now, hey, thanks! Um, the suggestion was to make a magnetic puzzle Mjolnir to look like the one that Hela breaks in Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> Which I thought that was kind of a fun, fun idea. You know, so you could actually kind of put it back together if you wanted to, but then you would have parts to drop. I know I made a joke about that when I made the actual build, where when I got the handle finished, but before I glued it in, I just threw it in the table with a whole bunch of uh, foam bits. And then early on said, well, I'm not going to make the one as from Ragnarok, because that's not really much to see. And then, you know, trying to be humorous on the internet. <laughs> 
Jeez, I cut the belt buckle off. That may not have been the smartest plan. That just means I'll have to put it back on. Oh, oh, this one's a better one anyway. Okay. All right, I will save this belt buckle. This is the one that'll have to go on the side because it needs to have a, a strap on one side. I'm not gonna remember which side that goes on. It goes on that side, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I might be messing that up, but that's okay. Uh, I think I was getting a question. Uh, yes. LK Siphon wants to know if you have made anything from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films. No, I haven't made anything specifically from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films. I've done, um, I did the web shooters from Homecoming because those were, well, he had them. They were actually Stark Industries web shooters from Homecoming, right? And the Sam Raimi films, it was uh, biologically created direct, directly out of, his, out of his wrist. That probably felt weird. Um, so no, I don't think I have. Uh, let's see, he didn't have, he didn't have adjustable lenses. He didn't have shooters in his wrist. He didn't have pouches or anything. So... He had the really awesome suit with the, with the super complicated webbing uh, silicon overlay. Um, and he destroyed all of them during the shooting. Hey, uh, quick quick side story. Uh, my friend Joe Gillis of Beyond Geek uh, actually got to be a, uh, an extra during the, uh, the <laughs> balloon ceremony in, in what? Uh, was that 2? Uh, Spider-Man 2? Whichever it was when they released all the balloons that had the Spider-Man webs on it and... and, and um, there was a scene with Parker. It was all about Spider-Man, but he wasn't there, I guess. It's been a bit since I remember. Uh, but Parker was supposedly taking pictures of MJ uh, during this, and uh, Toby was, you know, just picked someone out to, to center on as the person he was taking pictures of. That happened to be Joe. So Joe starts doing all the goofy, mm -hmm, you know, <laughs> and stuff and playing back. And... Uh, you know, to, to, uh, Toby gave him a, a, a quick little, you know, ah, thanks type of a thing, you know, they're just good time. Um, but uh, Joe's really happy that if you watch it on a big enough TV on Blu-ray where the, where the, you know, resolution's good enough, you can actually pick him out in the crowd. <laughs> All right, so it's got a ring. And since three of them go in, it's probably going to have to be a pretty big ring in order for three of these. Yeah. I don't think I can do it with a small, you know, the small ring would look better. That one's got the belts on it. Uh, Mason Rowell would like to know, why did you choose to make props? <laughs> I didn't choose to make props. Making props chose me. Um, <laughs> I chose to make props because... <clears throat> I've always enjoyed making stuff. I mean, most kids do, but I never kind of let go of it. Um, and the handheld... So even as a kid, you get the toys, especially, you know, in, in the 70s and 80s when the toys were really whacked and just built in order to accommodate the oversized electronics and be cost-effective for being mass-produced. So scale, proportions, even to itself, or accuracy of any type was just backseat to production so you would you would get these the you know like the the early star trek phasers were way whacked um later on playmates came out with 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 really good star trek props and star trek phasers they were just undersized they were scaled down um again it was for a production you know because if you're making something that's 75 percent of the size it should be it's going to be 25 percent cheaper to sell <clears throat> or more um so I got into building stuff because of that, because I like building models, and I, so I enjoyed building stuff that I saw on, on, in the movies in order to you know, just kind of facilitate that personal need to build and create. Um, yeah. And then as far as starting my own YouTube channel, that just that's something I have honestly lucked into. Uh, I have been building props and sets and costumes and makeup and monsters for all sorts of friends and music videos and uh, low budget productions and just for the heck of it all since always and when I was art director at Smosh so I got to do the sets and props for for Smosh for like two and a half years three years 
um, during that time, DIY Prop Shop was happening. And Dustin, who was the host at the time, decided that he was going to go on to something else. I have no idea what the de details were, but I got a call because Dustin wasn't going to be available and they were looking for a replacement host. And they ended up going with multiple hosts. They didn't want to be stuck in the position of what happens if someone leaves again. So that's why DIY Prop Shop suddenly went from <clears> just <throat> Dustin for like six or eight episodes to somebody new every week. Um, and that was my first big chance to actually be on screen, actually be a host, actually talk my way through how I build something. And that was awkward and totally outside of my comfort zone. I only ever wanted to be behind the camera. Uh, but, you know, look at the monster I created. Yeah, how's it going? <laughs> I think I answered that. Did I wander around too much? <laughs> uh, Talked to Darren about getting lunch after the show. and Got to tell you, I'm ready for it now. <laughs> Speaking of lunch, speaking of lunch, Anika Fire King uh, is wondering what ramen with kaiju meat would taste like. <laughs> what ramen with, with, with uh, kaiju ramen would taste like? Yeah. Well, specifically, let's see. <laughs> so I'm wearing a kaiju ramen T-shirt. Um, Ryan, I did put it on the right way, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I did dress myself this morning, so I better double check. Um, well, this is for a, a magazine that came out. Uh, now, it's only an electronic online magazine called Kaiju Ramen. I talked about it before, and I totally flubbed the name. And, and Travis, being the really nice guy that he was, sent me a care package to help me remember what the name was. And one of the things in the care package, and it was sent specifically because I couldn't keep it, keep it straight. I could remember Kaiju, but I forgot ramen. So you sent me a pack of chicken flavor ramen. Because, you know, Kaiju, you know they're going to taste like chicken. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Because well, I mean, they're basic, sort of dinosaur? Yeah, they're kind of sort of dinosaur-ish. And, and, and birds are the closest relatives to dinosaurs. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to go with chicken. Chicken. So sent me a, sent me a great print of uh, uh, a Gaijin, right? Oh, man. It's one of those things I've always seen his name written, but man, I don't know if I, I don't think I could pronounce it correctly. But anyway, yeah, if you only have hooks for hands, how do you eat ramen? And uh, what else we got in here? We got, got the note, and he sent me uh, his, his <coughs> kaiju ramen sticker. Is that going to be right for two? <coughs> Am I in the right spot for two? <laughs> um, yeah. So it should still be on on super, and that's the focus point, right? Oh, okay. It back. Oh, you did? You can just leave there it. We well, go. you do whatever you want to do. Pardon me as I direct the technical director that I volunteered <laughs> to come in. <laughs> That's such a cute sticker. Yeah, it's such a cute sticker, exactly. So I'm going to be, I've got a, a number of stickers on my <laughs> toolkit, right? Tool chest right now. It's behind the camera. You can't see it. So this is going to go on there next, next to all the others. Um, and then, probably a little too tight, but he actually sent me a physical copy of the magazine, which uh, th this isn't actually in print. So. This is a very low run. I don't believe you can buy hard copies of the magazine. But, um, yeah, that's it for the box. The only other thing in the box is the sticker that came with the shirt. So, what's happening with this? Why am I wearing the shirt? Why do I have, why do I have the book? Why was it funny that I messed the name up? Well, this was the first <laughs> premiere issue. And Travis contacted me after he had this ready because he saw that I was making a Mecha Godzilla suit. So he's going to interview me in just a couple of weeks for the April issue that's coming out with, uh, with the progress of my Mecha Godzilla suit. And I'm extremely excited about that. So I'm looking forward to, to actually talking to Travis, being in Kaiju Rama Magazine uh, issue two, which will be, it's like five bucks. It is, it is a inexpensive magazine because you know, he's not paying to actually print it. You're buying a PDF. But still... I, I don't care. That's great. I'm, and I'm excited to be in a magazine, basically. How else, how else do you put it? Being an old school pre-internet guy, being in a magazine is kind of a cool thing. You know, sort of like uh, Val and Earl saying, you know, hey, we, we, we name these Graboids. We get to be in People magazine. Um, <laughs> and one of the fun things for me is issue one. There's a whole write-up on, on, on Caesar, who is the other slightly furry kind of ancient, uh, well, they're all sort of ancient, kaiju from uh, Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla, right? And, and even uh, Ar 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 Aquilius, what, what was his name? 
He, he <laughs> appears near. Oh, um, no, Angurius. Who appears in the very opening, like being upset in, in, in Antarctica because Mega Godzilla is doing something. And so he's wandering around in the snow and something blows up and he falls and he doesn't appear again in the rest of the film. <laughs> it's like, well, why is he here? <laughs> you know, maybe I'm forgetting, but that's, from what I recall, that's what it was. So, much, much fun. And then there is a, uh, you know, like he actually took a, a trip to <laughs> Caesar's Caves where they did the filming. Uh, so it's a really pretty neat magazine. It, it covers, you know, and not just that, but um, there's bits on Jurassic Park, fan art, there's different uh, articles. So it's it's a kaiju magazine. It's all about kaiju. What more do you want? So I'm sold. I'm wearing the t-shirt. John Doe's been asking this nonstop. Uh, <laughs> did you get the last email he sent you about the thing? Oh, okay. Yes, there's all the emails I've been seeing about the cane. Now, the fun thing with the cane is the emails aren't formatted in a way that I could 100% tell if they were spam or not. Uh, and so I've been getting these emails about making this cane, possibly out of metal. And um, I did get the last email. At the moment, I don't have it memorized as to what it was. I think it was trying to discuss price still. Um, let me let me get back to that email and actually uh, answer you appropriately. <laughs> so Kaiju magazine. It's even got a really good picture of the oxygen oxygen destroyer from the '54 Godzilla film, which has been a requested prop going back to DIY prop shop uh, that I built make the oxygen destroyer, which is really kind of neat. So. Uh, yeah, I'm actually interested. Um, it's silver, so I guess it fits my theme. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got... Uh, I'll finish Mechagodzilla long before I start another kaiju build, I think. Is this going to be... Able, am I going to be able to get three in here? i got two sizes of rings. Looks like I've got one that's just too small. Maybe? I have to thin the leather like like it is here so it can wrap around. That's gonna be fun to do. Dribble! And then <laughs> um You know? Eh. I don't want to use that one. I'm not going to now, it's way gone. Speaking of Mechagodzilla, people are wondering when the next episode is going to be. My plan for the next episode of Mechagodzilla is actually the last Wednesday of the month. So sorry that was a little, a little far out. <laughs> I'm getting belted by my technical crew. <laughs> um, Back to work. Ah, I'm working. I'm working. I'm keeping the fans happy. Um, yeah, so the next part is going to, so, what is it? It's, it's the 8th, it's the 10th. I've got something coming up tomorrow that was just revealed last week. Uh, not tomorrow, I guess Wednesday is, is, is you know, a couple of days out. Um, and then, yeah, then i got plans for the week after that. Um, so, I might do a, I've, I've been seriously considering doing a small little update video. Instead of like, here's a big piece that's been built, I, I want to do, you know, all right, I've fixed the neck. And so that actually might, might come out sooner. Uh, but I'm planning on the next major piece happening the last week of, of March. So that's, it's a, it's a little bit out still. But I uh, want, want it to happen. And, you know, putting out the same week the movie comes out, hopefully will help it. You know, that's, that's only slightly intentional. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm looking at with the three belts is making sure I can wrap them around. Where's my scissors? Oh, it came off. All right. Making sure I can wrap it around the the smaller ring, because I've got you know an inch and a half ring and the two and a half inch ring, or maybe it's an inch and a half and three inch ring. What I need is right between the two, and I don't have that. Uh, but it looks like I can get all three of these belts to be forced through uh, the smaller ring, which will look better. I think, and so that's that's what I'm going to try and do. But what I need to do is, as it is when the belts are being made, the the leather is is, is thinned where, where it curls over the buckle, right? And so I want to do that again because I'm seeing that that is 
making it easier for it to fit around the ring. So I'm gonna, but I don't want the slit where the tongue of the, of the buckle goes. So I've cut, cut that off of this one. And now I'm gonna need to, I think I'm just gonna kind of fold it over and, and, and shave it and roll it a little bit and shave it to, to make it thin so I can wrap it around the, wrap it around the ring. Mm -hmm. Then I can pound some rivets in it because hammering on screen is the best. <laughs> <clears throat> Where is a sharp knife? There we go. That should be okay. I haven't checked Discord in a while, and it's almost one. That's good. But uh, it's good because I've actually got fan mail to open up at 1 o'clock today, which is kind of fun. Um, nobody's really said anything since the last time. Okay. <clears throat> so Discord's being quiet. That's good. Frankly built, definitely something to go and check out. Uh, so, something I, I did talk about on... So I talk about Discord. What is that? Okay, well, there's this lovely thing called Patreon, uh, Patreon where uh, my Discord server I've set up uh, in order for an easy way for me and, and everyone on, 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 in, within my Patreon group to talk to each other, share ideas. Uh, it's a direct, easy way to talk to me. Um, I can do that through Patreon as well, but that's kind of posting and reacting it's not really a chat the way you know i'm sure everyone here knows what discord is um so i've been really happy with how that works out what the hell was i talking about i lost my place discord the, what i shared over the weekend that i found that i've been really enjoying uh and maybe nicole can can cut and paste the the url because i know i shared it with her there's a channel i found called uh, Sense of Scale, or at least the, the, the video they did was called <laughs> Sense of Scale. I think the, the, the channel's a different production name channel. It is all interviews with the model makers from those science fiction shows and other shows from the 80s and 90s. So you're making any kind of movie at that time. CG wasn't really an option outside of making it look like it was going to be done with CG. So they have these interviews with these guys who built the you know miniature, 25 feet tall, uh, miniature buildings for Hudsucker Proxy, or all the aircraft they use for shooting Air Force One. Um, you know, even talking to guys that did the stop animation for the '70s television show Land of the Lost. And it's just he, however, the filmmaker found um, these model makers, and some are in LA, some are in in in, in Britain. Um, and doing interviews with them and just the stories and bringing out the pictures they got of working in the model shops, uh, getting to talk to the guys that helped set up uh, the, the first Star Wars, building the first set of miniatures for Star Wars, when they all thought it was still just some B-movie science fiction flick. They were getting paid, so they didn't care. There wasn't like this huge, <laughs> oh, I'm working on Star Wars. It's like, oh, I got work. This is great. And... Uh, <laughs> And one of them talked about, because again, this, this, you know, 75, 76 is when the models are being built for Star Wars, right? So one of the guys comes in and sees that in order to make all the plating stick to the blockade runner, they're uh, cutting up bits of styrene and then to stick it to the fiberglass, you, you, you couldn't use model glue. You couldn't use the PVC glue and stuff because it won't stick to the fiberglass resin. So the guys would kind of shape it tape it down with a five minute epoxy behind it and then move on to another part and then eventually come back and peel the tape up and, and make sure that the part's sitting right. And on occasion you have to try again because stuff moves and tape doesn't have a perfect hold. So he comes in with glue 325 or whatever it was called. It just had a number at the time. It was super glue. It was brand new, right? Because, um, you know, I remember when the commercials came out. Um, so he, he talks about how he called everyone over to the table he was at and said, okay guys, I got a new glue for you. And he takes a pencil and he sets it on the table and he said he put it at like just a slight angle and he took the glue and stuck a drop down on it and then let go of the pencil and of course it stayed <laughs> because at the time super glue was crazy dangerous gonna stick to everything right now glue it's actually watered down compared to what it was then and um, you know that got the attention of the shop and they ordered a case and a half of it immediately so <laughs> fun stories kind of like that if that's your thing if models aren't your thing if if um not the highest production quality, isn't your thing, maybe not the channel for you. But hopefully Nicole's sharing the URL for you in the chat and you can check it out because I think it's a really cool channel. It's been there for like 10 years and a lot of the videos have like 10,000 views. So um, I subscribed and I've watched that 
a lot recently because I'm just amazed that, you know, oh, that movie too? They're like five minutes, right? Because it's, the guy would go and do long interviews with, with, the, with the model makers and they would just talk for hours. But then he went through and cut down specific little stories from, from all of his raw footage, I assume, uh, to, make that were, to make these little stories specific to either the model shop they're talking about, like Boss Films or EEG or, <clears throat> or early ILM, or the, the movies or television shows that they were working on. And so sometimes you get sound bites that happen in both directions. Like there's one where he's talking about, uh, they're talking about the miniatures for Godzilla, for the 1990s Godzilla movie. Uh, and that was being done at the same time the Fifth Element was. And so they wanted, they need to make the, the model city for Fifth Element, which was then digitally enhanced, but all the foreground stuff was miniatures. And they couldn't rent anything because everything was being gobbled up by Godzilla. Right? So all the cities was gone. And then they wrapped shooting for a fifth element and Godzilla was still in production, so they ended up renting the, the fifth element buildings to Godzilla. <laughs> anyway, I think it's fun. So I'm gonna sit here and cut on the leather a little bit. So it is one o'clock. It's been a habit. I've been trying to do this. I'm not the best at doing it. To uh, do the whole, hey, it's one o'clock and station identification. Uh, hello and welcome to the Odin Makes live stream. Uh, for those of you that are just now tuning in, uh, what's going on is I'm doing presenting a live stream and working on the Witcher cosplay. This is the the basic vanilla starting Witcher cosplay that you start out with in the Witcher 3 video game. And the whole project started about because of the foam chain mail that Ben Eady put out with his foam armory uh, mm -hmm. website. So this is actually EVA foam chain mail. So it's very lightweight, it was very easy to put together. Uh, typically I have a co-host with me, Felicia. Uh, she happens to be out of town today, but she really wanted to do a project with the chain mail and we both agreed that this was gonna be the best project to work on and I think it was actually her suggestion to do live streams every Monday where we build it and so we're getting towards the end it's now down to making the belts gonna need to 3d print the wolf and, and put the uh, uh, put the straps on it so that's kind of where I'm at and every Monday from noon until 2 uh, California time so you'll want to adjust for wherever you are in the world uh, we just do a live stream talking to all of you and getting a little bit done on the cosplay every single week uh, the other fun thing that I try to do at 1 o'clock on, on, on the live streams, and I have it some today, is viewer mail. If you look in the description, there is a P.O. box. And if you want, absolutely don't if you don't want to because it <laughs> costs money. But if you want to send something that I open up and talk about on the show, you are welcome to. And somebody sent me something. So what I've got... We've talked about different swords that I that I could make and would want to make on the show. And Joe Horde, great name, uh, sent me a package inside of a package. <laughs> and in the package that was in the package was the silicone mold that he had made of the Red Ranger power coin. So this is the Tyrannosaur coin. Uh, I know it's just kind of a white blob to you on the screen. But um, uh, it's, it's the actual coin, which this was one of the pieces that was like a stumbling block for me. Uh, every time I look at the sword, because I was all for doing the Red Ranger sword, um, not having the coin and not having a good file that I could 3D print, because in my opinion, it looks like Saban actually pays attention to what's available for the 3D printing community, and the good coins, the ones you'd actually want to print, just aren't available. They keep, they're, they're taken down. Uh, like Google will still have links for them, or STL Finder will still say, oh, hey, here's one here. And you go, and Thingiverse says, yeah, no, it's not here anymore. So um, uh, anyway, he had the coins, and he made a mold, and then actually cast a couple. Now, the castings I haven't opened yet, so let's do that now. But what's cool is uh, he talked about, oh, yeah, I made a silicon mold. I cast my own for making my own sword. It all worked out really well, and then offered to, to send me castings. Like, oh, that'd be great. So he ended up sending me a mold in castings. And what I think is really neat is how he did the mold. Because um, that wasn't really talked about. Because, you know, it was, it's not really important, right? So how are the molds made is how the mold's made. Well, what he did is he didn't buy uh, mold-making silicon. 
What he's got here is, um, and I can smell the vinegar. This is bathroom caulking uh, silicon, and that totally works for making a silicon mold. It's not nearly as flexible as uh, mold making silicon, but I've done this to replicate the, the whole texture on a sailboat, <coughs> where I, I did a pancake of stuff like this directly over the textured portion of, of the fiberglass deck of the boat, of the boat, because I had a little puncture hole I was trying to fix. So I had glassed up the hole, sanded it down smooth, put on new top coat, laid the texture on top of it, and then when the, when the top coat dried, peeled my texture mold back up, it didn't line up 100% perfectly exactly right, like you know, there's no way it was going to. But if you step back like three feet and you don't see it, <clears throat> you know, if, if you look for it, you can find it. If you're not paying attention to it, you'll never see it. And so that's, you know, that's the one time I've used this technique for making mold and it worked really well. So what have we got? Yeah. The castings are really soft. I don't know. Am I holding this? Is this going to work for two? Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. So here's one of the castings. And I think it looks great. Uh, so definitely uh, the Red Ranger Power Sword is imminent. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen in March or if that will happen in April. Might happen in April because I was just talking to the wonderful folks at Cause Tools, and they're looking at sending me some more equipment. So I might do the Red Ranger Power Sword with the Cause Tools build, and that'll happen in April. Or should. You know, I don't, I don't know 100% if that's going to happen or not. What's interesting is now I'm looking at, I wonder what he used for resin to do the casting. Because it's got a really, it's thick. It's like this one's, is this one of his originals? This has got glue and, and, and foam on it. I wonder if this was one of the original ones he peeled up. Frankly Built must have heard you talking about him because he's in the chat now. Oh, sweet. Hey, Frankly Built, how's it going? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Nicole told me wonderful things. Uh, I saw a little bit and I saw wonderful things. So, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Nicole says, now it's a party. Now it's a party! <laughs> Who needs? Yeah, it's a party. I was gonna make a joke about who needs Joe and Joe, but yeah, it's, it's Frank. It's not Joe. This was Joe. It wasn't even Joe Gundam suit Joe. It was uh, Joe Hort. So, Joe Hort, thank you very much. I really appreciate. I really honestly appreciate uh, having the coin sent to me. Um, one of the things I talked about in the live streams is I know there's a local comic shop that I talked to the guys and they said, yeah, sure, but that all happened in late 2019 and there's this whole pandemic thing and I haven't been to the Comic Command Center since. So, um, well, I've, I've got a mold now. I still might go because they they have the coins and, they, you know, I could pull my own mold. <laughs> I, could, I could sneeze. I could pull my own, that's fine. The, the shop is really dusty if you guys don't know. Um, I could pull my own mold and, and have a potentially uh, cleaner mold. And, and, of course, I could get all the other Rangers as well, right? But uh, the Red Ranger sword was really kind of the, the goal of the plan. There. Now I'm back to trying to work on a... Hey, we're an hour into the stream. <laughs> You've managed to talk nonstop and barely get anything done in the build, which is pretty normal. This is one of the benefits of having a co-host is... Um, there's cool. points when you can Thank shut you. up and they talk. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've done live streams where I end up just building, right? And um, while some people like it because it's kind of like we're all building together, some people mm -hmm. are like, this is the most boring live stream I've ever seen. <laughs> it's like, oh, thanks. Oh, Advixen with the $5 super chat. Ooh, Advixen with the $5 super chat. Uh, I know it doesn't matter for the sword, but do we know what the back of the coin looks like for the other uses? Um, the back of the coin that was sent to me, it's a single-sided mold. So it's a bit <laughs> like the uh, headpiece of the Staff of Ra from Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the back side is just... Flat. Flat. Yeah, it's just, it's just how the resin's set up. So there's no detail. I think the back side of the coins are all lightning bolt. I think it's the, the, the original Power Rangers kind of logo where it's just the... The over-stylized lightning bolt. I think that's all they are on the actual coins. Um, but the, the faces are the Tyrannosaur and the Mastodon and the Triceratops and all the different uh, dinosaurs. 
So, <clears throat> not that a mastodon's a dinosaur, but yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> and they're all billions or millions, billions and billions of e millions of years apart, so it really doesn't matter, or hundreds of thousands anyway. On the topic of dinosaurs, DJ Stumpy wants to know... Um, <laughs> no, I'm not making a velociraptor build, that's somebody else. <laughs> You've done a couple Jurassic Park builds, is there another item from the films you would like to do? Um... see it's kind of it's kind of cool because i'm i'm actually trying to think of what what <laughs> i've done one <laughs> <laughs> i've done one for sure that i know that i did more than one of um i would have to really look again i mean the night vision goggles are cool but they're a little toyish so it's kind of weird that those are neat but not quite neat enough um the original ones from jurassic park right um, a lot of the stuff that's really fun is kind of safari gear from from the majority of the sequels. And uh, YouTube frowns on uh, realistic guns just a little too much. Um, I guess the control collars are kind of neat. So, you know, of course, there's always puppets. <laughs> you can always make a baby raptor puppet. Uh, so there's, there's possibilities. Uh, to be honest, it wasn't something that was super high on my radar. I know there's a, a movie coming out with everybody in it again, so uh, we'll we'll see. See if something something new appears. Is that good enough? I know I can't I can't cut too much off because it'll just tear. But I want to make it thin enough that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's good. Just like that. <laughs> I gotta do that. Well, only two more times. <clears throat> He's only got one ring. Um, the little Y thing that's on, that's on his on his on his harness has got just a single single ring of the front around the back. It just kind of disappears behind the swords. Presumably, there's a wing a ring. More than likely, it just attaches to the straps in the back, so it doesn't wa wander around. Or at least that's our plan, because <clears throat> um, these asymmetrical harnesses are a bear to keep in the right spot if you're not you know pinning them down in some way mm -hmm. you have to put little weights and stuff on them so they sit right otherwise the 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 weight of the ring is just going to migrate and 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 move as you walk around <clears throat> okay so there's one uh let me do the other one This down. This is getting to be pretty warm on me. <clears throat> there we are. That's what I wanted. Craig Holden says you can make a moving model of the DNA guy from the first. Oh, Jurassic right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mr. DNA. Right, and there's the, the whole mosquito and amber that was done on DIY Prop Shop. Oh, yeah, that would be um, cool. Yeah, from that same sequence. Uh, yeah, Mr. DNA would be pretty cool. Um, I wouldn't mind... So after I got done with my video of doing the, uh, the shaving cream can, where <laughs> I just used whatever it was I used, a little glass vials, and it was, it was a mess. Um, then I found on Amazon accurate enough actual medical vials that that you would use that that and so I've, I've replaced my the one that i've done i've replaced with these these newer vials and um i bought a package of like 500 of them for like 20 bucks <laughs> so for whatever reason i've got a slew of these silly things now <laughs> for for my you know dinosaur emb embryos but uh, yeah that was really fun T.A. Zolzon. T.A. Zolzon says. says uh, <laughs> you can make a Hello Kitty cosplay suit for funsies. Yeah. Could make a Hello Kitty cosplay suit just for funsies. Um, I've seen some fun Hello Kitty mashups. You know, there's, there's actually an official Hello Kitty Gundam mashup kit you can buy at the 7-Elevens in Japan. Um... So it's, it's Hello Kitty wearing the RX-78 Gundam. Um, and I've seen online comics with Hello Kitty and the Xenomorph. 
Uh, <laughs> there's there's a match made in yeah. <laughs> Nope, definitely could. Oh, come on. Since, since you like uh, silver so much, <laughs> David, David Oceanak says he can make the Mark I helmet from the first Iron Man movie. Ah, okay. I could. What I really need to do is make any Iron Man helmet. Yeah. I made War Machine. Ha! It's silver! Um, <laughs> but, um... That's one of those things that people ask forever for me to do. And, and that it was even happening at DIY Prop Shop. Make the Iron Man helmet. Uh, and I know that's been a major request, and I really need to do it. Um, for the longest time, I was afraid to do it, because I didn't want to make derp Iron Man. I was really afraid that I was going to mess up the the the... the Dimensions, and you'd end up with, you know, uh, derpy Iron Man. Uh, I'm not so afraid of that anymore, especially after having done um, War Machine and super happy with how he looks. But the, there's enough stuff going on with, with trying to make other projects at the moment, as well as uh, just kind of life in general in the background that I haven't wanted to put in, you know... <laughs> That's still intimidating me. <laughs> but uh, an Iron Man helmet, that'll probably happen, you know, spring. You know, it'll, it'll happen this year. We'll, we'll, we'll make a, a gold and red classic, you know. I don't know which mark because I don't have them all memorized. Um, I'll be honest with you. My absolute favorite version of Iron Man is from uh, Toy... Uh, uh, what is it? Mego Theater, right? Toy, Mego Toy Theater. Wow, what is it called? So there was a... There was a comic price guide called Wizard, the Wizard Toy Guide, or, or the Wizard uh, Price Guide, that came out when I was working at the comic shop. And they would take, uh, it was Mego, Twisted Mego Theater, that's what it's called. And they would take the Mego action figures and um, set them up, um, you know, pretty much just like Robot Chicken. Robot Chicken was actually inspired by Twisted Mego Theater. And they would just do photographs with bits of clay to change the expressions and, and, and you know, give them big eyes. Well... Spider-Man was kind of the host of Twisted Mega Theater, and he was he was a, uh, a self-aware, fourth-wall-aware, um, <laughs> uh, media-aware type character who was just, and he was he was jaded, and done with everything. You know, he was he was he was fun. Hulk was you know a mess, and and the Cowardly Lion, um, Thor was prissy, and uh, Iron Man was just a pass-out alcoholic drunk. <laughs> And for whatever reason, that's still my favorite version of Iron Man's. The Twisted Beagle Theater, on, on the ground, covered in Budweiser cans, just passed out. <laughs> so, fun stuff. But, um, yeah, that was uh, Wizard Magazine. They ended up, yeah, like I said, that, that inspired Robot Chicken. Canned tuna. Uh, Canned tuna. Yeah, Canned tuna, hello. Would like to know what is better polycarbonate or acrylic plastic sheet? Well, so Cantuna wants to know which is better, polycarbonate or acrylic plastic sheet. It's going to depend a lot on um, what your usage is, what, what, you, what you want it for. Polycarbonate would be overkill and um, not worth the, it's not a big expense, but not worth the expense to make a trophy case, to make a case you're going to put something in. Uh, but polycarbonate is the type of plastic that safety glasses are made out of, that, that welding visors are made out of, because it's, it's, a, it's a long chain plastic polymer. I think I'm saying that right, molecularly, molecularly speaking. So it's, it, when it flexes, it just bends and turns white and gives, and it's got a lot of strength. Whereas acrylic is a very brittle plastic. You can bend it, but you have to heat it in order to bend it. And if you bend it too much when it's just cold, it'll actually break and, and kind of shatter in a plastic sense. It's not like glass shatter, but, you know, it'll, 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 it'll break and it can splinter. So I would sparingly use acrylic as any kind of visor. There's times when you want a certain look and you're not going to get a whole lot of choice. Um, but polycarbonate's definitely, or even PETG, which is something easier to vacuum form with, is uh, are going to be uh, better choices for for visors, in my opinion. Um, 
Yeah, so it's going to depend on, on your usage. Polycarbonate is what bulletproof uh, windows are made out of. Typically, a bulletproof window has a layer of glass in the middle with uh, whatever <laughs> glue and then a layer of polycarbonate, then whatever glue with more polycarbonate and again and again, and you end up with a, a, a nice thick bit of this bulletproof you know, window that can take a few bullet hits. And because of all the layers and, and even the center layer of glass, um, the bullets don't go through it. They get, they get trapped. You know, yes, you can get a high enough caliber and you can shoot in the same spot often enough. You can punch through bulletproof glass. It's not like invulnerable. But compared to, you know, normal car glass, which a golf club can go through or a golf ball can go through, it's a lot better. <laughs> Uh, 50 pound super chat from Frankly Hilt. Wow. Uh, people, <laughs> Thank you, Frankly Hilt. Wow. People like you show kids they can be anything. Channels like this remind them that they never have to grow up. Right. Uh, being a nerd has no limit or restrictions. Thank you so much for being you. Thank you, Frankly Built. I totally agree. <laughs> And, and I think it's awesome that you, you are um, also inspiring. Inspiring anyone to build anything is, is in my opinion, really cool because it activates so many different things mentally, tactily. There's so many different disciplines that go on with sticking through a, a project and finding it all the way to its completion that uh, I'm sure it's healthy for anyone on any level to build anything. You know, if, if you really want to think about it, making a cake is building, right? I mean, it's chemistry. You, just, you get to eat it at the end. Um, I eat too much cake. Uh, <laughs> but no, thank you. Totally. <laughs> and thank you very much for the compliments. I appreciate that. <laughs> Ad Vixen with another $5 super chat. Uh, Iron Man armor? Nah. Rosie the Jetsons robot made to keep Felicia's allergies away. Yeah. Yes. Someone locally, uh, I was at a, a so the, I, I, briefly I worked at the PBS station locally, KVIE, and twice they did a PBS Nerd Con, right, which is kind of a, a little thing they did for, for their members. It was a little mini science fiction con. So there was a, a local Sacramento artist who has made replicas of Rosie. Um, and what was the other robot? There was a couple of different robots that came by, but Rosie's the one that I really remember because it was a... She looked really good. She's probably three-quarter scale. She wasn't quite full size, but um, it was really very cool. So, yeah, no, it'd be great. I actually, <clears throat> we kind of nice yourself a Rosie to clean the shop, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> get one for my house. Yeah, get one for the house, exactly. The foam smith would like to know, what is the best cheap, thin, strong plastic that can be cut without a motorized saw? So the best, strong, thin, cheap plastic that can be cut without a, a motorized tool, polycarbonate. You can get polycarbonate sheeting really thin. And um, you can order it online if you can find a plastic sheet supply near you. Like, I always talk about tap plastics. But tap plastics is West Coast only. They don't, uh, they don't have any stores, you know, much past Colorado. Um, but this, uh, um, interstate plastics... Uh, they're, they have an online footprint. Their their main facility is almost walking distance from here, but they they're, they're online. There's a, there's a bunch of different plastic places. You can get very thin uh, polycarbonate. It's <laughs> almost always clear, um, and that is something you can cut with scissors. You can just and a half. Uh, and and if you want to cut it with woodworking tools, you can. So you can buy it thicker. And if you're careful and slow and aware of what you're doing, because plastic is not something that just haphazardly play around with with table saws, uh, you can cut it. And um, the problem is plastic, unlike wood, well, pl wood war when wood heats up, it burns, right? It creates smoke, you can smell it, you get scorch marks on the wood, oh darn. Or the wood will get grabbed and the, and the saw will fling the wood usually right back at you. Um, plastic will warm up and melt. Now it doesn't melt and turn into slag. What happens is it gets gooey and flexible ever so slightly. But from the point of view of a table saw, that's a recipe for losing fingers. So you can cut polycarbonate on a table saw, but you need to be aware that the whole thing is ready to bite you in an instant. 
So you kind of want to make sure you're very you're as safe as you can be. And buying the right blade is, of course, the right way to go. It's a triple chip carbide tip blade. They're you know fifty dollars saw blades, which if you're an independent guy trying to pay rent off of you know a fast food salary, not like I haven't done that more than once, a fifty dollar saw blade is just outside of the, of, of possibility. Uh, but in the grand scheme of, hey, medical bill for getting my finger stitched back on or a $50 saw blade, I'll take two saw blades, thank you. <laughs> I think they're actually more now. They were $50, $50 blades 20 years ago. They're probably more now. Probably. So, probably. But uh, polycarbonate. Uh, no, uh, I said PETG. Uh, I, think, I think that's the uh, appropriate polyethylene, whatever, whatever. It's... Um, it's a, it's a food safe plastic, or at least was. I don't remember how the public feels about it right now. Mm -hmm. um, that gets used a lot, or was used a lot for water bottles, and it's very, very easy to vacuum form with. Um, and uh, because it heats up very quickly and it holds its shape. And that particular one, if you use the synthetic dyes, uh, RIT makes fabric dyes, and they make a synthetic fabric dye specifically for polyester fabrics. Well, it works on all the different other fabrics as well. And I've seen, William Shakespeare did it not too long ago, and I've seen a number of other tutorials where you, the people will vacuum form their visor and then start boiling a large pot with the, the RIT dye in it. And it's not boiling, it's like a heavy simmer because you don't want to lose your vacuum form part. But you, you dip the visor and bring it out, and you do that six or seven times and you get a really good smoky tint on it. Or you can tint it blue or whatever. And that RIT dye, it sticks and works. So you start out with a clear visor, and it's an easy way to tint it. Haven't done it, but when you watch it on the internet, it sure looks easy. <laughs> yeah. Everything looks easy on the internet. Everything looks easy on the So I'm sitting here cutting away at leather, and Darren's just trying to read comments and laughing at them. What? What? Uh, apparently, uh, Nicole's messages are disappearing or something. I don't know. She's accusing me of deleting stuff. Oh. I would never, madam. <laughs> Just because you're signed in as me. <laughs> Jordan Fiddle. Hey, I'm back once again asking about that Mecha Bubble Scorpion logo. <laughs> oh, the logo? Oh, we talked about that, huh? <laughs> Ask him about the Mecha Bubble Scorpion logo. He'll know. He'll know. <laughs> yeah. Um, he does know, kind of. Now I'm trying to remember exactly what we, talk, we talked about. Last week was a really weird, busy, weird week for me. Um, to the point that I'm still in pro... I mean, you hear this every week, so this is no big surprise. I'm still in process of trying to get the build done for Wednesday. But it's a simple build this week. I should have been done with it a long time ago. Um, I don't remember right now what the... What we're going to do specifically for the logo. But um, I do like Bubble Scorpion and... Uh, Mecha Bumble Scorpion, whatever. <laughs> and wouldn't wouldn't mind uh, continuing doing more with that build. Um, if you're in the Sacramento area, and if you can hear me over the Dremel, um, SACCON is going to be happening uh, Easter weekend, uh, which is the first weekend in April, uh, at the Placer County Fairgrounds. And at the very least, I intend on attending. Um, I've got a polite request out that if any other vendors, um, cancel, I would be happy at the last minute to come in and set up, you know, an, an, an ex exhibition booth, uh, at one of the empty tables. 
but um, you know, it's not it's not important to me to actually buy a full on uh, booth because if, I'm not going to be making money. I'm just going to be setting up an exhibit, talking to you guys. So. If you're in the area and you want to go, uh, you'll probably be able to catch me there in some form. Spaz says, hey Odin, just want to let you know your builds rock. Sweet. Thank you, Spaz. That's, Thank you, Spaz. That's enough. <laughs> Spats. <laughs> spaz? Spaz. Oh, okay. Spaz. Yes. Gotcha. There's what I want. A wee little block of wood. I'm gonna need to find a hammer. Cantuna asks, have you seen Monster Hunter x Tobo Godzilla armor? I think you might like the design. You should check it out. No, no. Monster Hunter X Toho? Yeah. No. I know. Does this Is this separate from Monster Hunter, the video game? Is this, is this something else? No, I'm not familiar at all. I'll have to, I will have to look it up. Of course, I'm not writing it down, which is going to make it really hard for me to remember because... You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that left says, "Looks like oh, you got a lot done today." <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> what? It's been an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one thirty. I got I got a little bit of time still. I don't know if they just tuned in and was like, "Hey, it's." Put together. Oh, uh, yes. Or anything. It's, it's put together. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to work on the, on the belts that go in the front, but I keep talking. And uh, apparently I'm not able to build and talk at the same time. At least not to the camera. I always feel like... I just feel like I want to want to actually interact with you guys. I actually want to talk with you guys, not just, you know, not just build. <laughs> which, which may sound funny, but, um, you know, yeah, kind of where I'm at. Uh, Mark Swartz uh, has a cool question. Do you still have contact with any other makers from Top Shop? Yes. Um... I, I can still easily get a hold of Hendo, and uh, on more than one occasion I've talked to her. Um, it's been a while since, since I talked to Vinny, but uh, I do still have Vinny's contact information. Uh, I still have contact information for a couple of the production people. Uh, I haven't talked to them in a long time, but I'm sure uh, Brandon and, uh, and Michael would be happy to talk to me if I reached out to them. Um, I've talked to Elizabeth a couple times at cons, uh, and that's... It's kind of it. I never really talked to Dylan, and I never talked to Dustin. And it wasn't that um, I didn't want to talk to Dustin. It was just we all came in kind of because he stepped out, and so he wasn't really part of it anymore. And there seemed to be... I don't know what the deal is with that, but um, there, there definitely seemed to be a little bit of... Um, that was then, this is now, from the crew when we were working on the show, right? <laughs> how to put this right? <laughs> how to say this correctly on the internet where it's going to be permanent and <laughs> Michael or somebody else might hear it later. <laughs> huh. The phone smith wants to know if there's a way to simulate a hydraulic punch without electronics or engineering. Way to simulate a, hy a hydraulic what? Punch. P punch? So like uh, for, for, for punching up metal? Like as a tool? No, uh, um, I, I don't know. Well, you didn't my, say my assumption was something like a, like a rocket arm, you know, that goes... <laughs> sure. Or, or Veronica's arm, go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> um, okay, sure. Um, like, oh, like how... 
hydraulic tubes to make a fist. Like hydraulic tubes to make a fist. Okay. <clears throat> um, most of the hydraulic tubes... Making hydro hydraulic tubes to make a fist is such a... I mean, if you can make a super giant oversized power glove, but... Um, most of the hydraulic, you know, the, the tubes that slip inside of each other in whichever way you'd want to try and make it work to make it look like a finger's working, those are going to be completely decorative. Um, the way to, the best way that I know to easily make a finger that you can close is uh, just with strings or cables. Uh, and strings, you want more than sewing thread. You want something that's got some strength to it. Um, but the right hand of doom video I did is has got to be the simplest dirtiest quickest way uh to to make one and that's where you take the slightly flexible translucent tubing it's get used a lot for water tubing uh for for refrigerators you can find it at like all hardware stores but what i did is i i, I took a few pieces and cut them roughly finger length and then uh cut notches in it and i think i melted the, the corners to make sure it wouldn't split any further so you ended up having kind of a a, a, a three pyramid shape where the, the centers of, of each of the fingers are with this divot that went down about two thirds of the way through the pipe where each of the knuckles were. Um, then you take the tube and there's a base piece that goes into the palm of the hand of, of your puppetry, puppet, puppetry hand, right? So you've got your solid piece that's the hand because that part really doesn't move much. It does because it looks like the meat moves but physically inside the bones it's not really moving much. Um, so that was just like a square bit of wood. And then you, you stick this tube into the end of it. Um, and then what you do is you take a bit of string that's the tendon. So you have a part that comes out way down here. This is the part you're going to pull. And the string goes all the way up to the tip of the finger. You put a little rod through the end of the finger. I think I just bent a piece of coat hanger. And the string goes around that rod and comes back down to the base of the finger. And what happens is uh, when it's fully extended, because now you've got this string that's going through a, a simple pulley, uh, when it's fully extended, that's the longest the string is going to be. And when you pull the string, it actually reduces the length of the string, which causes the finger to curl up. Um, and then if you wanted to be really high tech about it, you set up an entire secondary string uh, that runs the other direction. So you can pull on it to force the finger back open. And you could actually force fingers to hyperextend that way if you wanted to for that you know, really alien, queen, you know, grabby finger thingy. Um, <clears throat> that's, you now as far as hydraulics, I would just have two bits of pipe that slipped over each other with, with a little bit of clearance that were painted like they were leaky hydraulic pipes. <laughs> uh, because the, the cable control puppeteering, um, not only did I read about that constantly in everything that, that the monster guys were doing in, in the 80s, uh, for, for, for making creature effects of, of any sort. Just from personal experience, it is super easy to do. And with the right hand of doom, all I ended up doing was tying it to literally one of these rings, just this, this one size smaller. And so I put my finger through it, and then I could just pull with my hand, which was enough to pull to make the, the, the fingers close. And with the right hand of doom, I was able to uh, actually hold a cigar, put it in my mouth, let go of it, and then reach up, grab the cigar, and take it back out of my mouth. I had enough dexterity that I could do that with the simple pull string mechanism. Oh, this is like all the parts that I need. So, yeah. Uh, was that right? Or was that the wrong question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he did add extra info halfway through here. He's making crossbones arms... And oh. wants them to punch. Oh, okay. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago I watched that, and I'm not remembering exactly how crossbones yeah, punch. Punching mechanism. So, uh, so like I, I'm a, uh, the like it's in a fist, right? Right. And it actually like like extends out and kind of punches. Yeah. Um. Okay. I really have to kind of play around with the mechanics a little bit. Um. Obviously, actual hydraulics is just not going to work because the wattage you're going to need, the battery power you're going to need to run the pumps to make it work, right. uh, and it's going to weigh a ton. Um, Spring-loaded is going to be kind of crappy. Uh, it would work. So, you know, if you had a um, 
So the hydraulics are still BS. It's just tubes slipping over each other. To make the motion happen, one idea would do a linear gear with a round gear. So you have a linear gear, meaning it's just a, a flat bit of something that has the gear teeth on it. You could 3D print it. You could buy the Lego pieces. And um, that would be attached to the end of the end of the fist, maybe on, on two of the rails. And then you would have your round gear that you could potentially rotate by squeezing a handle. You know, it could be string hour. There's, there's, there's ways of making something rotate from doing this type of a motion. So you did that, you make the gear rotate. You could, um, due to the diameters of the gears or, or gear reduction, you could make it come in and out fairly quickly. And I bet you could do something like this and make the fists move in and out without a whole lot of problem. If you had a string, uh, not a string, if you had a spring or elastic as a retracting mechanism. So you put the force in it to force the, the fists to go out, but you can relax your hands and the fists retract and stay retracted. That would probably be ideal because you wouldn't have to hold them the whole time as you walked around. So um, that would be probably the first direction I would go. And if that took me down a wrong road, I would then figure something else out. <laughs> Are you actually familiar with the crossbones? No, not, talking about? not well enough. I'm assuming this is crossbones for the beginning of Age of Ultron, right? Or is this yeah, crossbones from that's, like? That's what I'm thinking of, but I don't. You know, I don't specifically know. Yeah, I don't. I don't specifically know either. And it, it could be crossbones from. Uh, there's a crossbones character in Gundam. Uh, isn't there a crossbones in uh, uh, Overwatch? I Civil I know. War. Yeah, civil War. So, oh, Civil War. Okay. The, the MCU crossbones. Yeah, okay. So I was thinking the right guy. I just said the wrong movie. No, I don't know it well enough to specifically remember how it looked and how it worked. But um, as a generic thought experiment during a live stream, um, how's that? <laughs> <clears throat> as, as a generic thought experiment during the live stream, uh, I immediately thought of um, the pistons, I guess, from Lego guns. Lego guns? Those are, yeah, so like most uh, so manual Lego guns are, uh, <laughs> it's, it's on the inside, it's just basically two plastic tubes, uh -huh. and it cocks back and latches right. until you pull the trigger, and then it then it fires forward. forward. Sure, okay. So is that uh, is that spring loaded or is that pneumatic? Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's most of the ones I've seen are basically kind of like uh, toilet paper. Okay. Spring load, but like yeah. obviously a way stronger spring. So like I I could see that working. You'd have to like reset the fist every time you right. activate it manually. But right. Somewhere along those lines, depending on how, like, obviously large they are. Right. <laughs> so there's another thought. If, if, you, if you heard that, using, um, you got the telescoping tubes with, with a spring inside, like the way the toilet paper roller tubes are, which I've used a ton of, especially in DIY Prop Shop, uh, to, to, to compress it and, and make it fire back out. Um, so it becomes a spring-loaded fist with a single, single thwunk. Um, that would work, too. But yeah, you know, like like Darren's saying, you'd have to manually reset them, or you'd have to have uh, some sort of additional setting in order to help them reset. So you're uh, going back to the string idea. You could probably run something from your shoulders. So if you extend your arm out completely, it pu to puts just enough pull on it that it pulls the fist back in. So you could like punch and reset and punch, uh, or you're just going to be you know pushing them back in. You know, you punch them out and you end up pushing them back in against your forearms. You know, which, that would work. That would totally work. But it would be kind of a one-shot deal. That's why I was trying to think of doing it with um, um, something you could just pull with your hand and then it automatically retracted so it, was, it wasn't latched. But that's not necessarily the easiest. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Awesome. Thank you so much. That helps. You bet. If you get something working, please share it with us. And then he says, 
That was my idea. I'm assuming he's talking about the the Nerf dart or the Nerf gun innards. Probably. <clears throat> Very similar to the Nerf gun innards. Uh, I thought about Nerf gun innards for um, fingers on Mecha Godzilla, uh, and I'm still entertaining that idea, but right. it's not uh, super important for making the fingertips fire off. Right. You know, because getting the rest of the suit built is way more important to me than making the fingertips fire off. Mm -hmm. But then there's the issue of, I'm fully kitted up in, in, in Mecha Godzilla. I don't want to go chase a fingertip down. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to, like... Yeah, it becomes the, the, the job of uh, 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 of the handler or... What's it called? Uh, uh, attach strings to them so they don't actually fly away. Yep. So Darren's saying you'd actually have to attach strings to them so they don't fly away. Absolutely. That was definitely something I was thinking about was um, <clears throat> making it more like a cork gun. <laughs> so yeah. you just kind of go, yeah, exactly. ha, 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 ha. Yeah, that'd be funny, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> and it wouldn't break any con rules because the majority of the cons, at least in my area, don't want projectiles. So um, if it's attached and it just pops off and it's humorous, I think that would be a solid win. <laughs> That left points out that you can mod the suit once it's finished. Yes, absolutely can mod the suit, and I've done that before, and and that is a kind of a kind of a plan. Like I say in the update, it's kind of like modding the suit as I go. There's three different things I still want to do to the head and neck that I had before that I haven't haven't finished yet. I want to make the magnets better. I want to improve the rotational uh, attachment because it's. It works right now. And that's the best description to put on it. <laughs> uh, I want to do some sort of a cantilevered uh, pulley system to make the mouth open by attaching it to a chin strap for me so I can actually make the mouth open. Um, and I really want to put a fan in it so I can circulate the air through it. <laughs> you know, all these things, a lot of which I, uh, is not that hard to do because um, the electronics are self-contained. And I've got drill batteries that I can plug in that I can make run for the 12 volt lights and for the 12 volt uh, fan so that's that's not that big of a deal and I think I found a fan I haven't played with it yet that should be quiet enough that it isn't going to make me deaf inside of it you know reduce even the reduced hearing that I've got um, so need to play with all that haven't played with it yet I think I think first is changing the rotation of the neck Which the plan for that was actually attaching a aluminum lazy Susan. Yeah, that thing looks cool when you showed it off a few weeks ago. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's back here in the wall with all the tape. <laughs> <laughs> Managed to find a 10-inch aluminum uh, lazy Susan, and this is what I'm planning on using. Uh, to to fix the neck, and I specifically wanted aluminum because it would handle the weight. But because uh, it actually has some weight going on with it, it's just foam, but there's still enough going on. Uh, I'm gonna need to grind down the outside because this is just a little bit too big for what I made. And I can make the neck again, or I can grind this down. <laughs> Tuxedo Man from oh, man. Outer Space. That's a great name. <laughs> right? Can you make the Predator's Mask from Predator? Um, the Predator's Bio Mask is a, another one of those requests that have come up many, many times. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to. Um, I haven't. Why haven't I? I don't know. I guess because I get distracted from the idea of it. I need to do this again because there's a logo that would be just right there. <laughs> if I was to put this on the way it is. This is actually a really thick belt. I wonder if I can. Uh... These are the same. This is. Why is it called the Lazy good. Susan? Uh, so, um, Predator Biomask, I wouldn't have a problem making. Why is it called a Lazy Susan? It's probably best to ask Susan in the 60s <laughs> or the 50s. <laughs> I really don't know. But that is a common enough term. You can actually Google Google search it. And that's what they're called on the shelf at uh, at uh, big box hardware stores. You know, like Home Depot. Because for whatever reason, I don't want to say the name. Um, <laughs> it's just what they're called. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I've only ever heard Lazy Susan. I have no idea if they have a 
Yeah, if they have another more generic name, turntable. Yeah, you know, I guess. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I guess Susan was just really particularly Lady. couldn't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I just can't. <laughs> Two belts that match. I want to, uh, sorry I'm stepping off the screen. I want to see. You can pop the chat out if you want to. I can make it easier on you too. Um, so what I'm doing and why I'm off screen is I'm trying to look up a picture of the Witcher to make sure that I'm doing the right thing with the belt. Well, it's only one that I put two in, so there's that. Uh, okay, so it's, it's very much in the front. That's what I wanted to know. All right, so what I was trying to double check on was um, the, the buckle is visible, and I didn't know where it was visible, and it should be right here. So that's good to know. Oh, where is it in relation to his chest? Okay. Well, I've got the... I've got this belt put on wrong, but that doesn't matter. It's only clipped in place. So it's going to go... Oh, it's kind of right over. Is it right over the... Yeah. That's kind of right over the, the thing. So it needs to go about here. And then this needs to be visible. So I want this... Can I go there? All right. I cut the belt. I'm committed. You can close that window and go back to where you were if you want. Three dots. You can pop out chat. And that might make it easier to read. Quality leather. <laughs> <laughs> All that fuzz. Yeah, quality leather. According to Wikipedia, yes, uh, the explanation for the term "lazy Susan" oh. has been likely lost to history. No. Oh. <laughs> so according to Wikipedia, the we don't know. We don't know. The 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 the. Actual history for the term Lazy Susan is lost. So, all right. <laughs> well, bummer that. Train. Train. hanging on his shoulder. That's why I can't find it. I set it down. <laughs> All right. Well, I went and did it wrong and I put two rivets on, so now I'm committed to the double rivets, but, you know, oh well. Pieces? I think I have both pieces. 
that's wood. There we go. Of course, if I, uh, oh, well, that got dull. <laughs> <coughs> Jen Jefferson invented the Lazy Susan in the 18th century. They were called dumbwaiters at the time. <coughs> he invented it because his daughter complained she was always served food last. So, if you didn't hear the full story, Thomas Je Jefferson is credited for, for inventing the Lazy Susan. Apparently, it was first called a dumbwaiter. And he invented it because his young daughter complained about how she was always served food last. So, was, was, was she Susan? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> the, the, the name Lazy Susan, for all we know, could very well just be marketing. <laughs> Regardless of the origins of the name, by 1917, it was advertised in Vanity Fair as Ovington's Eight dollar fifty a mahogany revolving server or lazy Susan. Oh wow! <laughs> the terms used predates both the adver advertisement and probably the country. Um, okay. Okay. So lazy Susans are older than the United States. Apparently. That's not, that's not too surprising. The United States really isn't that old of a country. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in our teenage rebellious years trying to figure out our identity. Now we're free! <laughs> Despite various folk and, and... Wow, word. <laughs> Despite various folk etymologies linking the name to Jefferson and Edison's daughters, <laughs> the earliest use of these serviettes or butler's assistants being called the Lazy Susan dates to the 1903 Boston Journal. Oh, interesting. That's actually not that long ago. Yeah. Yeah, that'll work. That and that. So I need one more. Now, she says she's got these belts. Hmm. Digging off to the side in the bin of project. Trying to see if I can't find one more. Yeah, there we go. Is this the same style of belt? So all the leather matches? Yes, it is. That's what I wanted. Okay, good. That's easy. Faster than trying to shave it with a oh gross a knife. Uh, Jack of all trades <laughs> says Odin. Another food question. Do you oh, like gosh. pickles? Uh, no, actually, I'm not not a huge fan of pickles. They're they're fine. Um, uh, I, I it's odd. I like vinegar as a flavor, but um, yeah, pickles and brine pickles are good too. Uh, but on stuff, sure. As their own thing, I don't think I've ever craved. You know what sounds good? A pickle. I don't think I've ever had that. <laughs> Guess I haven't been pregnant. I'm allergic to pickles. Oh. We're gonna go to a Mr. Pickle for lunch, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> there actually is, or at least was, a uh, sandwich shop in in Sacramento called Mr. Pickle. <laughs> it was just a. They were a good sandwich shop. I haven't seen them for a while. Are they still open? I don't know. Maybe they're not. Something else of permaclose. <laughs> Good question. Cake or donut? Uh, both. Right. Donut cake. Um, <laughs> cake donut. That's an actual thing. It's, yeah, cake donuts are an actual thing. Um, 
Generally speaking, probably donuts because they're just easier to get a hold of. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I like a good cake! <laughs> Dan Does Junk says there's still a Mr. Pickles and golf. Oh, is there? Sweet. Well, I mean, it's golf, so... It's golf, yeah. So, you are, so what you're saying is it's not worth it to go to Galt just for Mr. Pickles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's probably true. But, you know, Galt Lodi did uh, bring us A&W root beer, so. Oh, did really? Yep. Uh, World War, end, end of World War One. that was uh, uh, one, of, one of the startings for it. It's one of the stories I worked on for when I was working at PBS. Because they had their 100-year anniversary not too long ago. Oh, Connor Cook wants to know, what's the scariest voice you can do? Scariest voice I can do? <laughs> um, <laughs> so all these all these political ideas come to mind, none of which I can do. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's always just, it's always just the gravelly thing. It's never, you know. <laughs> There's never really anything all. There's never really anything all that scary. Um, oh, thank you. So, yeah. Swear to me. <laughs> Swear to me. <laughs> Sinistar, beware! I live. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an old '80s video game. Not quite like the old Sega game, where like half the cartridge memory was used for Sega in the very beginning. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But Sinistar had uh, a really good speech speech synthesis for when the main villain, Sinistar, uh, suddenly became sentient and he was going to start hunting you down. Because the whole game, you're running around trying to collect resources so you can destroy Sinistar while his little drone ships run around and collect the same resources to build him up. So, it was a fun game. No possible way to win it. It was a fun game. <laughs> Like winning one that was like that was important on any machine you fed quarters into. <laughs> Jack of all trades says, Odin, top five root beer brands. Oh. Uh okay. Um well in no particular order. Uh let's see. Henry Weinhardt's uh Virgil's um when you could get the actual brewed A and W root beer, because because the restaurants used to brew it on site, and there was a number of them, you could tell because they had the really old buildings. Yeah. Uh, they would still do it. Now that they've all gone to these, um, you know, strip mall pop ups uh, mixes with other, it's all fountain sugar crap. Um, but those were good because they, you know, uh, trying to think, are there other ones that come to mind? I can think of a couple I didn't didn't care for. Dad's root beer is not bad, uh, as far as one out of a bottle. Uh, out of a bottle, that's a little more you know um, uh, corn syrup uh, based. Um, yeah, kind of running out because those are sort of my go tos. <laughs> my, my favorite big brand is Barks. The Barks is good. Kind of just don't like. I don't. I don't like A and W. Uh, ever since they stopped. You know, being homemade, I guess. Right. Well, uh, yeah, the, the stuff that came in the cans was always the stuff that came in the cans. And it was fine, but, yeah, it's not. There's a there's a really good uh, birch beer you can get at uh, Amy sometimes. Birch beer? Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with, with birch it's, beer. It's a... Uh, Red Birch Beer, I think, is what it's called. Okay. And it is... I don't even know how to describe it. It's... So like standard root beer has, like, the taste of, like, you know, sarsaparilla. Or yeah, whatever, sarsaparilla. Right? And, yeah. This Red Birch Beer is... So like, like the best thing I, I, I the best way I can describe it is like 
spicy root beer. Like it's okay. not spicy, but it's got like it's got more going on. Bite to it. Yeah. That would be good. Uh, IBC is usually pretty good. And I think some of the older IBC root beers don't have a label. They just got molded bottles. They've got the no. you know, molded the glass of the bottle. Um how was the other one that was coming? Oh, uh, Bundaberg, which I know is like Adam Savage's favorite ginger beer. I've been drinking the ginger beer a lot and enjoying it. But Bundaberg's root beer, they've got a, a different formula, and it's not the root beer flavor I want, if that makes any sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. That's, that's. And then like Dad's root beer was exciting because, oh, alcoholic root beer. Too much corn syrup. It just, it's, it's got all the texture and aftertaste of a NyQuil shot. So it's not something I want. <laughs> not a fan of corn syrup, if you can't tell. <laughs> Alan Adams says, you need to make an outtake video compilation and call it Odin Makes Mistakes. Odin Makes Mistakes. <laughs> New question, but does YouTube let you do double cam, like a uh, craft cam over the work area? Um, that's not a YouTube issue. That's a, that's a hardware issue. Uh, this one would. Um, the, what, what I've got should be able to do picture in picture, but I've never really forced myself into figuring it out. So um, I probably should <laughs> read the manual. Uh, but... Um, the, what I've got is a Blackmagic Mini uh, uh, Atom Pro, A-A-T-E-M Pro. It's not Atom, that's a Atom, whatever, however you pronounce it. And it has a single channel of uh, DVE, so it should be able to do picture in picture. Uh, but it's not something I've really tried to work with. And that would, that would totally make sense, you know, because basically I'm just cutting belts and, and hammering and putting rivets into it, which may not be something a lot of you have seen. To me, this is very old school. <laughs> I've been doing this, you know, 30 years, so I'm not really thinking about it a whole lot. <laughs> Aside from, don't mash them too flat. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I've got, uh, got the stem that I'm putting behind the... You, you, you can't see it. It's it's like it looks like the, the end of a screw head. Got the little stem that I'm putting through the the um, leather on the back side. Then I got the mushroom cap that I'm putting on top. This is the decorative side. The user the the you're going to see on the outside of what's being worn. The the rod that I've got here, this chrome rod, it's got a dish shaped indent on the one side, and that's what I'm putting over the mushroom cap. So I'm not just flattening it out. And then I'm hitting it with a rubber mallet just because it's. It's a slightly softer sound for the microphone. You know, a metal hammer is a bit better. It's not going to tear the hammer up as much. But that's just got a bunch of dull thuds instead of the ting, ting, ting. And just a few hits. And what's, what happens? And what happens is the mushroom cap mashes down over the the, the top of the stem of the uh, of the rivet. And it causes it to flare out on the inside, and you're mechanically locked. Um, there's if if it goes on wrong, because uh, it's possible if you put a rivet on that's where the stem is too long for the amount of material is too is longer than the thickness of the amount of material that you're riveting together. Uh, it'll 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 fall over on the way of being crushed down. It won't just crush down flat. And then you're kind of hosed because it's ugly on the outside. You can totally see that the rivet went down crooked and you got to get in there and cut it out. You have to drill it out or get in with snips behind it and really undo it. But um, for me, step one with doing, the, doing the, the strapping that I've got was working with the Dremel and creating a, a small dusty mess. I was thinning out the leather, so when it wrapped around the, the metal ring, it's a smaller ring, but it's a metal ring, when it wrapped around the ring, that would um, let the leather not bulk up too much. And it was, honestly, it's what I was seeing what the manufacturers did for the actual buckles of the belt. So I'm copying what manufacturers do. Then I took a, I do it all the time. I hear snickering, I do it all the time. Um, then I've got a hole punch. This one is one that has a variable... Uh, bits I can put in for doing different sizes, and there's a one 
that was specifically made just for the rivets that came in the package with the with the setter that I'm using. But anyway, so I'm hole punching through both layers of leather. So I've got two halves here with a ring in between. Then I take Mr. Stem, whatever this is, and from the back side, right, so this is the side that will go against the wearer. This is where the, the straps are. This is the unfinished leather side of the belts. I'm pushing in through the back side of that. You turn it over. And I set the whole thing down on top of the anvil. And this one's double-sided. It's flat on one side, which is what I'm using. And on the other side, it has another dish because you can buy double decorative rivets where both sides have a little decorative dome so you can see it from either side. The ones I've got are single-sided. The, the back sides are just plain. So that, that's flat. Putting it all together flat, holding all the pieces down together so I don't have a whole lot of gap. Not that that matters, it's just... I mean, it does matter. You don't want gaps, right? But uh, I'm pretty sure that if you're careful enough striking it, it's going to go all together. But it's one of those weird little habit things that I started doing. The, the button top is actually two different pieces of metal. There's the inside piece that slips over the stem. And then there's the, the polished decorative uh, side that goes over it. You can hear it rattle. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the microphone can pick that up. But that just fits over the stem. And then take the dimpled side of the striker, put that over the rounded bit, and then you make it permanent. And we have the most of a Y-strap. Uh, I was snickering earlier because Craig Colton said, this episode is riveting. <laughs> yes! <laughs> this episode is riveting. Uh, KFD Fitness wants to know if you play D&D because they think you would make an amazing dungeon master. Thank you. Um, I have, but I haven't any time recently. D&D was something I did a bit in high school, and... And I realized I was doing it because of the miniatures, because I liked painting the miniatures and making the little miniature sets. So very quickly, I moved on to Warhammer, uh, <laughs> which was just even more toys and more painting and more models and uh, less fighting over, you know, <laughs> uh, stuff. So I have played role-playing <laughs> games, and I do like them, uh, but generally speaking, I don't. And it's not... I don't know. It's I think it's just... Um, Um, it's the lack of toys. There's plenty of toys, though, with, with the DD. It's easy to get a hold of. Also, it is uh, 2.15. It's uh, 2.15? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, let me get... I didn't bring another clip over here. You know what material they used for the Predator dreads? If not, what other materials can be used to make them? Um, so, the more recent one, I'm sure silicon, because everything is. Yeah. Um, what was it in 86? Um, well, that's all right. No, I don't know. Probably just foam. I would. I mean, there's there's a way of uh, you know you uh, foam rubber. You actually make a, the the casting right, and then you mix up uh, uh, foam rubber usually with a, um, a mechanical mixer, and you bake it in an oven. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a lot like baking, only it's not yeah. edible. Um, not more than once. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they were just foam latex. Uh, from from eighty six, the newer ones I'm sure they're all silicon. Um, how would I do it? Um, you know I might actually just use neoprene. Uh, you can get um, so in addition to to craft foam, which is you know the thin sheets of foam, you can get sheets of neoprene. Sometimes it's fabric packed; it doesn't always have to be. But that would probably give more flexibility, but you'd still have the volume, and you'd still be able to glue it shut with uh, contact cement in order to, to, to make the dreads. Or I've, I've seen, it's a little harder to find, but um, you can get pipe insulation. You can get pipe insulation that's got a skin on it. 
uh, most of the stuff that I see at the hardware store is about an inch and a half thick, which is too thick. But the HVAC guys that I've seen working on stuff here in the building have some that are only about an inch thick. And that'd be fine. And that would probably be <clears throat> what I would want to go for if I was doing... Because that's already round. It's, it's going to flex fine. It's already black. And getting a tip on that is easy because you just cut it on an angle and roll your, your cut together with contact cement. And you, you get a you get a kind of a pointy tip. It'd be slanted, but it would work. Um, that's probably you know, as long as I knew of an easy way to get a hold of the of the insulation material, and it wasn't like this unobtainium for everyone else. It's probably what I'd want to use. But it is two fifteen, and I promised Darren lunch for coming by and helping me out by fielding questions, giving me some some prompts to talk, uh, and helping to take care of stuff uh, with with the chat. And since our two hour show is now at two hours and fifteen minutes, I want to thank all of you for spending the afternoon with me, watching me bang together uh, this little three three part harness. Um, and honestly, I really enjoy spending Monday with you like this. And I thank you all very much for hanging out and asking questions and teasing me about silly things that I did in my videos because that's what I'm here for. And, and frankly, Bill, thank you. If you're still watching, it was a lot of fun getting to meet you briefly. And seriously, if there's a way for us to get together and do something, I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, thank you, Nicole. And uh, to everyone else. Thank you all very much. And I know there's going to be lots of different ways to really muck up and muddy the waters when you're trying to say goodnight to everyone. But this is how Odin says goodbye.